Well, are you ready for some word today? I feel like we've already had some word today. Good encounters with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit this morning. Turn with me to Isaiah 53. Let's get started today, beginning in the Old Testament. And we'll, we're going to read a little bit of old and a little bit of the new as we work our way into one of the epistles. So we're going to cover some Old Testament, some gospel, and some epistles today. We're continuing this morning with what we've been working on, even though this is our first official Sunday morning together. We're, it's not our first sun, time together. And so we're going to work on the creed a little more. And we will break away during Advent because we want to focus ourselves on the arrival of Jesus as we enter Christmas. So once we hit December, we'll shift gears a little bit towards the end of the calendar year. Uh, but we will pick this back up because it's very important to me that we understand the theology of our Christian faith. And that doesn't mean that we understand all of the things we're supposed to believe, but that we truly and fully, at least as well as we can, understand in whom we believe, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we are linked as more than a little room of people who like each other, uh, hopefully at least like each other, and we do love each other, <laughs> but we're linked by more than that to a church at large, to a church universal, to a church that's meeting all over the world right now, but also to, a, to the church that has met all since the Lord's table. And we cap that off every week by eating from that table, but on the way there, understanding the Father that we are encountering, the Son who has encountered us, and the Holy Spirit, whoever encounters us every day walking among us. That brings us to the line in the creed that he, was, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. And I was tempted to talk about the suffering Jesus in relation to the next line, crucified, died, and was buried, but I can't do it. And the reason that I can't do it is, well, one, crucified, died, and buried needs its own time, but also I can't do it because there is so much to be said about the suffering Savior. Why did Jesus suffer? And why, if Jesus suffered, do we celebrate it in the creed? Surely, if we were going to build the perfect announcement of our faith, we'd leave that part out because, well, losers suffer, right? The bottom suffers. The top wins. The top is powerful. The top is victorious. The top conquers. Why would we talk about the suffering of Jesus? Ignore it like it didn't happen. Leave it out. But we don't, and we never have as a body of believers, and we haven't left it out because it is crucial to our understanding of why Jesus is Jesus. And it's crucial to my understanding of why I follow Jesus and I don't follow someone else because it would be easy to follow, to go find a hero, a winner. We try to do this in our lives. We do this with our mentors. We do this in our businesses. We do this in our politics. Go find someone who wins and who's gonna help me be a winner. But then when we come to our faith, we turn to he who suffered under Pontius Pilate. So let's lay some Old Testament on it because the Old Testament is what Jesus walked into. Remember, Jesus walks into a world that is built on the, under, the theological understanding of an Old Testament world. And so it might sound like this, Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces... He was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises, or as some of your translations will say, by his stripes, we are healed. If you don't see this as Jesus, let me help. <laughs> because his name's not in the text, right? Isaiah 53 doesn't say Jesus is coming and he'll be this. But as believers in Christ, we see this as Jesus because Jesus is beaten and striped and bruised and wounded. Where we struggle a little bit, as Christians, is seeing Jesus acquainted with sorrow, which means that Jesus is so used to being sorrowful that he's grown acquainted to it. That's a little tough for us 
Because we kind of like to see Jesus as his head's up, his chest is out. He's super confident. He never has any problems. He cruises through life. He kind of floats around healing people and feeding empty bellies and raising the dead. No problems. Yet the Isaiah 53 that puts Jesus on the cross, wounded and striped, also says that he was acquainted with a sorrowful existence. That there was something about him day to day in which he understood what it meant to be crushed, to be wounded, to be mocked, to be outcast, to be made fun of, to be stepped on, to be left out, to be marginalized, to be forgotten, overlooked. I can keep going. None of them are positive. And this is what stings about these sermons, and this is why we wish stuff like this wasn't in the creed, because if Jesus suffered, well, then surely the creed's going to turn at the end and go, he who suffered is going to make some people suffer. <laughs> right? That's, that's where our sensibilities lean, but we know better because we know the Jesus story, and we know that Jesus takes the suffering into himself and then willingly goes and dies. And this is what we signed up for, is to follow this. Now let's ground it. It's, it's, it's foundational in Isaiah. Isaiah already existed when Jesus came along. That scripture was in the world. People may not have seen that as Jesus until well after his death, but Jesus saw himself in Isaiah because remember, he quotes Isaiah in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me. Okay, And so Jesus, is, his foundation is in that, but let's ground it in reality in John 19. So go to a gospel reading. And we're going to do something here in this gospel reading that the creed does and has done now for many centuries, and that is place Jesus in the real timeline of man. John chapter 19, verse 1, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face. Now, I wanted to read this because two reasons. One, I wanted to read it so that you would see more suffering. Oh, I know, not fun. Jesus getting beat up. But I also wanted to read it so you'd see Pilate. And the reason I want you to see Pilate is because this is the moment in our faith that grounds Jesus in reality. Jesus was not some mist some imaginary figure that lived a couple of thousand years ago. Did you know that by the second century that was what was being taught? Jesus wasn't a real guy. This is just a message. It's just the embodiment of good. And the early church started to rally around, no, we believe he was real. You know, even by the second century, you might have had a grandparent or a great grandparent that went, no, I saw him. I'm telling you, I had met him. And so the church realized that if they didn't ground Jesus in reality, he could become a mist. And how many of you know that's still an issue? Because if we don't ground Jesus in our real lives, he just becomes a principled teacher. You know, he's the Buddha, he's karma, he's whatever, he's ideas and they're great ideas. And people, even in people in the world will say that like, oh, I believe Jesus was a, he, that, that, that's some good ideas Jesus had, but that's not enough for me <laughs> as a follower of Christ. I'm not following good ideas. I don't know about you. I've got, I know some people in the world got some good ideas. I'm not going to, I'm not willing to lay my life down for them. And so by grounding him in pilot, what we're doing is grounding him in history. Why do we need that? Okay. Uh, we have watches on our wrists. We have a phone with a calendar on it. And everybody in the world that has a phone has the same calendar, right? Like nobody else's calendar is different than your calendar. Right now there's a universal clock. And since we are all using digital devices more than ever in the history of the world, we're all kind of on the same clock. Um, time is easy for us. I mean, like we, we, we understand the year, the day, the month, this day for us, will go down in history at the garden as the day when this began. And, and there'll be people in the future that will say, I was there and we'll know they weren't because we'll look around and go, no, they weren't here, but they're going to say they were here. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff happens, right? Um, time's easy for us to catalog. It wasn't easy for them because there was no universal clock. Uh, there was no universal calendar. And so it's very common in the Bible to hear these kind of phrases. In the year of King Hezekiah. In the fourth year of King David. Why does the Bible do that? It's timing things. 
so that it would be like saying this. Imagine we didn't have a calendar and you went in the third year of President Reagan. Then you would just you would know, OK, that was about when I was this old. Uh, you wouldn't even need a calendar. You would, ju- unless you did, wasn't alive in that time, you might need to say, which one was that? <laughs> but the ancient world would have done that too. It's like, w- where was that? So when the creed puts him in pilot, it's grounding him in reality by adding a human figure that the world knew and then placing Jesus inside the world of that human figure. Okay, and so when we say he suffered under Pontius Pilate, we're doing that to say he was a real man. Now, why did I give you all that? Well, part of that's Bible study, but the other part of it's more than Bible study. It's to let you know that you serve a real human. That Jesus is both human and divine in, him, in, in one man, and that if you don't see him that way, then you don't take his suffering seriously. Because if you don't see him as really human, you're like, well, you know, it didn't really hurt Jesus. He's God. We can fall into that trap. Suffering wasn't a big deal for Jesus. He's God. How are we going to make God suffer? But by grounding him in a human body, his suffering is as real as your suffering. And your suffering is no different than his suffering. And I ask, why is it important that Jesus suffer? Well, that's obvious. But if it's not obvious, I'll help you. Because you do. In fact, it's the thing you have in common with every other human being on the earth. You might not have skin color, language, economics, geography, none of that in common. But you know what you do have in common with every one of the billions of people alive and the countless people who have ever lived? You've suffered. And if you haven't, you will. And I don't mean you suffer to the same degree, but you suffer. Either your physical body suffers, your mental mind has suffered, your emotions have suffered. You've suffered in loss. You've suffered in abuse. You've suffered in lack. You suffered rightly because you did stupid things. You've suffered wrongly because the world is cruel. Right? You have some. You might need to take inventory of them once in a while, lest you forget how blessed you are. That's always a good thing to say, where have I suffered? In what way did that shape me? In what way did it make me the man, the woman that I am today? And in what ways would I like it to shape me? Because if you don't acknowledge suffering, you might act like it didn't happen. And if you act like it didn't happen, it keeps happening to where it shapes the person that you become and you never really deal with that suffering. Now, now, that all sounds pretty secular though, right? Like I wouldn't even need to know Jesus to have told you the last three minutes. Like I could get up here as a motivational speaker and say, you're all going to suffer. Here's what you, here, here's some of the ways you could, you've suffered. Here's what some of the things you might need to do about it. In fact, I could be a good Buddhist. Buddhism teaches life is suffering. That's one of the statements of Buddhism. Life is suffering. And they say we suffer because we desire and we're ignorant. They even have two principles behind it. We suffer because we want stuff and we shouldn't, and we suffer because we're ignorant, and stuff isn't what we think it is, and that causes us to suffer because we don't know the truth. Well, you know, they're probably not wrong about those two things. A lot of my suffering's been because I wanted stuff I didn't need, (laughs) and then a lot of my suffering's been because I'm too stupid to know the difference. Okay, well, chalk one up for Buddhism, I guess. Here's the problem as far as I see it. Christianity is not trying to counter that. We're not trying to come up with another way to explain suffering. The problem, as I see it, is that that leaves you all by yourself in your suffering. Good luck. Deal with your pain and your problems. And hey, there's worse things to tell people than deal with their stuff. But wouldn't it be better if somebody who has went through your stuff could hold your hand? You see, what we have in Jesus is the man that stepped into our suffering. What Christianity offers that Buddhism can't offer and no other faith as far as I can see can offer is that Jesus does not promise you to take your suffering away. Jesus promises to step into your suffering. Jesus does not stand out from the outside and say, you've got some problems, people wronged you, you did some stupid stuff, bad luck, karma, situations, world, 
Hope you make it. Me and dad are waiting for you in heaven. Good luck. But rather, Jesus steps into the human existence. It's God wrapping himself up in us so that, not so that he can from a distance know what you feel like, but so that he can know exactly what you feel like. So our faith tells us that at Calvary, Jesus encountered everything you would ever encounter. He felt the weight of it in his spirit, in his soul, in his body, and in his mind. So that the cross becomes the place where God suffers with me, not just for me. The gospel, I know we've presented it as Jesus suffered for you. The danger in leaving it there is that we love to add this tag. I know I added it for a while. I would say Jesus suffered for you so you don't have to. You go, well, that sounds really good. Boy, doesn't it though? The problem is it's not true because you do suffer. Even after you meet Jesus, yes. That didn't take a genius to figure that out. We just had to shut that part of our brain down to amen the other statement. You know, we just had to act like, well, nothing bad's ever going to happen. I found Jesus. Listen, we're a grace place, okay? This isn't a place you're going to come in and encounter legalism, the law, condemnation, shame, performance, religion. Everybody get out there this week and jump through this hoop. And if you do, God will bless you. That's never coming out of my mouth. I've been released from that. I don't ever intend to step back into it. In the midst of that statement, I will say this. It is not a grace place that tells you that now you've met Jesus, there's no more problems. <laughs> okay? That now that you've come to the faith and now you know Christ, that if you really... Because this is an easy trap to fall into. I know, because I fell into it. If you really knew who you were in Christ, you'd walk in such favor that all that other stuff would go away. Ladies and gentlemen, No. Welcome to the world in which, yes, you will suffer because you live in it, but a world in which you don't ever again suffer alone. Mm -hmm. By Christ taking into himself our transgressions, our wounds, our pains and our problems, what Christ does is he steps into your molestation, mm -hmm. your trauma, your beating, your loss. These are the kind of things that we need to be saying in the gospel, so I'll say them. He steps into murder and rape and abandonment. He is not a God who puts these things on people so that they can see what they're made of. You have a good father. Let no man say he is tempted of God, for God tempts no man with evil. So God is not in the business of playing chess while you're playing checkers. And you're just trying to live your life, and God's out thinking you're out smart, and a bunch of junk happening to you. And God goes, well, someday if you get good at this job, you can avoid this stuff. No, this stuff happens because we live in a world in which not everyone is concerned with the good. And bad things happen to us, so Jesus steps into the human existence and says... I'm going to let it happen to me so that when it happens to you, not if, but when it happens to you, you will know that you never suffer alone. You will know that I went to the cross and took into me everything that you are. This gives us the opportunity to place our cares and our burdens into Jesus. To go to the Father with, Lord, I've, this has happened to me, and this has happened to me, and this has happened to me, and I lay it at Jesus' feet, and I see it crucified in Christ, so that whatever Jesus becomes on the other side of the cross, I have hope that I can become that too. That if there's a part of me that needs to die, and sometimes the part of me that needs to die is my old filthy pride, and my greed, and my lust, and my jealousies, and all the stuff we all know are titled, and some of it is just wounds and pains, and issues, and problems, stuff done to me that I've been suffering through with like a cancer in my soul. And it's made me mad at the world. It's made me afraid of people. And it's made me fear God unnaturally. Have you ever been there? And we're going to be encountered by a lot of people who walk in with that stuff. And they're going to bring in their, their pains, and their miseries, and their problems, and their issues. And we're not going to have platitudes and principles that are going to make their week better. But we are going to have a clear path to Jesus. He loves you. He cares for you. He was wounded on your behalf. He suffered under what you suffer with. So that he can take it into himself. 
Christianity is not at its best when it accounts for suffering. Christianity is at its best when it sees Jesus in suffering. So I can't account for why we go through it. I know we do. But I can say that Jesus goes through it with us. And I can promise you that being in Him is not a promise that you won't go through it, but it's a promise that you won't go through it alone. Here's an important principle that is Christ-centered and part of our discipleship. And that principle is we... Let's elevate it. Okay? Let's, let's elevate the statement we all suffer. Let's let Buddhism have that. Life is suffering. Okay, congratulations. You came up with an obvious thing. Can we do better? In Christ, yes. We are called into Christ's suffering. Not just our suffering. You're going to get your suffering. Your suffering is going to happen. We're called into Christ's suffering so that we step into Jesus and whatever Jesus has told us is the life of His Father, we take the repercussions of whatever that is. So when Jesus says, you have heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, and you know it's not going to be good. You know it's going to be, because you kind of like that one. Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. This is a good way to live. And he goes, but I say to you, and you go, oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. I got a phone call. I got to take this call, Jesus. I, I, I don't have time to talk right now, but we, we have to listen. And when we listen, what we hear him say is, but I say to you, turn the other cheek, let him smack the other side. You go, whoa, wait a minute. What I say to you, he says, is love your enemies. Pray for your persecution. So when I say to you, church, you're called into the suffering of Christ. That's what I'm talking about. That Christ invites you into a space where you know you're going to suffer and where you don't get to pull the sword and cut people's heads off. <laughs> he invites you into a space where you follow him and following him is not always following him into the winner circle. It's following him into the loser's bracket. Really? Sometimes it is. By the standards of this world, it's sometimes following him into the loser's bracket. And him going, it's okay. There's an eighth day coming. The beauty of the creed is he suffers under Pontius Pilate. He's crucified, died, and is buried. He descends to the dead on the third day. He rose again. See, we're not, we're not going to leave him suffering. We've got an empty cross because Jesus isn't hanging there. But we have a crucifix because we need reminded that he does. And we need reminded that sometimes we do and we put a part of us in him so that it suffers together with him so that whatever we need purged is purged. Let's look at an epistle on this. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I, I really, as of late, have been re- encountering Peter's little epistles. Those two little letters near the end of your New Testament. What an awesome journey Peter takes us on. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 21. No, I'm sorry. First Peter chapter 2. My mind knew better. My Fingers didn't. It wrote down a two, and they should have wrote down a one. And I looked at it and went, something ain't right. So apologies for wasting your turning time there. <laughs> well, here's the good news. Now you know where Second Peter is. <laughs> Just right behind First Peter. <laughs> First Peter. Chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you and leaves you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Some of your translations say, on the tree so that free from sins we might live for righteousness by His wounds or His stripes, you have been healed. I want you to notice that you are called 
into the same Jesus who suffered. You've been called and invited into the one who hangs at Calvary, into the one whom Pilate beats across the back, into the one who bleeds and suffers and dies, into the one acquainted with sorrows. That calling means that you won't always have everything smooth. You've been, you're following the wrong guy. If you want everything smooth, you're following the wrong guy. You've been invited into the one who takes upon him wounds and stains and invites your wounds and stains and says, bring them to me. I think we make a mistake here, if, if I may be so bold. I think we make a mistake when it says, he bore our sins in his body on the tree and by his stripes we healed. We think that sins there are stuff we did. I think we think that what the gospel is, is Jesus took to the cross everything you've ever done wrong. How many of you heard the gospel something like this? Jesus went to the cross to pay for everything you ever did wrong. Okay, I'll amen that. Just don't stop there. <laughs> just, just, he did more than that. You see, you're called to follow the one who suffered. Why? Because you'll suffer. He's inviting you into his suffering and he's inviting your suffering into him. So it's not just what you did wrong, it's what's been done wrong to you. It's not just you're missing the mark. It's the whole system missing the mark and hitting you instead. It's what people did and you hit, got the fallout. Has that happened to you? Again, if it hasn't, I don't want to depress you, but it will. Welcome to humanity. Like I love seeing little kids, the thing that always stings is I know there's some suffering in their future. I hate it. I can't protect them from it, not entirely, and I wouldn't want to. The truth is, is that they need some suffering. Some suffering makes them stronger. Some suffering lets them know they're real and alive, but too much suffering crushes and destroys. And this is why we turn all of our sufferings to the one who took all of our sufferings into him. We turn to Jesus not as a crutch. We turn to Jesus so that we will die to what we were. It's actually bigger than him being a crutch. A crutch would be we take the cross and we use it as a cane and it helps us deal. No, you're not invited to use the cross to get through your suffering. You're invited to take your suffering to the cross and let it die there with Jesus, to put it up there with Christ, to, it, to step into who he is, realize, and you go, well, what's that look like? Well, it looks like 21, 23 rather. Sometimes he's, he's abused, but you don't get to return the abuse. You suffer, but you don't get to threaten. You trust the one who judges justly. What's justice? I told you this a few weeks ago. Justice is not people get paid back. Justice is people that have been stepped on and crushed get to be elevated. They get to be brought up. It's not that they get vengeance on their behalf. It's that they finally get mercy. When mercy has been the mercy has been the currency of the elite. In God, mercy becomes the currency of those who can't pay for it, who don't deserve it, who've been forgotten about, who've been overlooked, who've been stepped on. Mercy becomes the thing. That's the God who judges justly. He takes our issues as his wounds. Let me, let me land here. Say this thought. When Christ takes into himself our sin, he's taking into himself all suffering, not just what we've done, but what's been done to us. And by his stripes or his wounds, we are healed. Therefore, the promise that God makes is not that you won't suffer again, but that he knows how to heal you from whatever you've suffered from. And guys, this is a process that is best left in the hands of the professionals. Who's the professional? The great physician knows how to handle your tumors, your cancers, your wounds, your pains, your problems. Come to Jesus. Jesus said, it's not the righteous man that needs it. It's the sick man. It's the sinner that needs a physician. So the great physician is walking the room. What we're encountering with the physician is the process of his healing. It's him who is healing us of our infirmities and our pains. And don't think it happens overnight because not all healing happens overnight, but it happens in Christ. 
I feel like these are the kind of things that might as well be said on day one. This right here. I cannot promise you that you will receive your physical healing if you come to Jesus. Because I'm not a novice. I've been in this for a long time. And I've prayed for a lot of people to be healed. And I've seen people healed that I know didn't deserve it. <laughs> I've watched it happen. I've seen it. Miraculous. And then I've known people who, boy, if anybody should have got healed, that kid should have got healed. And they didn't. And we prayed. And we believed. And they believed. And we quoted the right scriptures. And we served the right Jesus. There you go. So I can't promise you physical healing for everything that... I got anointing oil and I'll anoint you and pray the prayer of faith and believe God. But I can promise you that Jesus can heal your broken heart. Can heal your abuses, your wounds, the stuff done to you. I can promise it because I've watched it my entire life. I've watched Him do it in me. And I've watched him do it in others. It isn't a quick fix. It's going back to the great physician over and over again for him to rewash you with the love of his father. For him to embrace you one more time with his forgiveness. One more time with his mercy. We keep confessing who he is. And in that confession, by his stripes, we are healed. So I can promise you healing for what's wounded you. In Jesus, not in me, not in cleverness, not in preaching, not in songs and poems and sermons, but in Jesus. That is a guarantee of the covenant. He takes into himself all that wounds us. I present to you today a suffering Savior. Jesus suffered for you, suffers with you. And heals you from whatever it is you suffer from. Doesn't promise no more suffering, but promises no more solo suffering. No more solo suffering in Christ. Father, thank you for this today. What a word for our first morning together. <laughs> what a word that we see Jesus as your word says, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. That means he's the start of this thing. So Jesus is the start of this thing. And what did we see today? That he suffers the way we suffer. That when we hurt, he hurts. When we are in pain, he is in pain. And that the promise that you give us is not pain-free existence, but that you are the healer of what pains us and you step into it with us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' precious name.